Okay, back to me. Question? No. no. Okay. Well, I have a couple, but I'll wait till you. All right, thank you. Um, I've been asked to address enforcement prioritization, and one of them is, are the board's inspectors becoming too overzealous? In the last couple of years, we've added a number of new inspectors. That's where one of the areas where we've had the most growth. In, for example, in July 2014, we added 10 new inspectors to the board's contingent of inspectors at that point. These are pharmacists, that, again, that work from home offices. So the concern is, is that these people work in the field and there are investigators that when they walk into a pharmacy, they need to have a particular demeanor and not throw open the door and say the Board of Pharmacy's here. It's really important that they don't disrupt the operations, that the pharmacy can continue to operate, and that they can take care of their inspection or their investigation in a manner that does not disrupt. And so one of the things we constantly work with with our staff is to make sure that they have the appropriate demeanor when they go into pharmacies. It's, it's just too potentially a loaded situation for them. Sometimes we have complaints, although we have amazingly few, given that we have 46 field staff that are out constantly doing inspections, we get perhaps one or two at the most complaints a year. The complaints are handled by going directly to the suit, to either me, because more likely I'm gonna get the call, than the supervising inspector who the pharmacy may not know who the supervisor is, in which case the supervising inspector handles it, we address it with the pharmacy, we address it with the inspector, and we make a regular note on it, much like you would any employee you need to coach and change their behavior, we um, then move on. But, but one of the things, as Dr. Gutierrez indicated, that we are going to start to do, and we've already got the survey document developed, is our supervising inspectors will now do post-inspection surveys of the people we license as a proactive measure to find out what's working, what's not working, and how we can improve from the pharmacy's perspective. So that'll be conducted by a supervising inspector. The information will be called and put in an in a, um, unnamed a format so that we don't have individuals highlighted, but so that we can show what has, in fact, been said and build it into our model as a way of providing better service to the public and to our licensees. Um, we're also requiring our supervising inspectors to do something that they do while they're training inspectors and maybe at the time of an performance evaluation, but not routinely. We're going to require them quarterly to go out with each one of their inspectors on an inspection and observe what's going on just to see what they're doing, see if they need additional training, see if there's some additional hints or something else that the inspectors need to be more proficient and more um, appropriate in the event that that is a problem. We do not think that that's a problem, by the way, in the field. And the final thing um, that any, as I mentioned, that any complaint that does come in ends up with me at one point so that I am aware of what's going on. We also get compliments about our inspectors. I don't need to be on negative all the time. A lot of our inspectors become relatively, given our fees, even though they may go up, are, are very inexpensive consultants. They've been trained and focused on pharmacy law, pharmacy practice, and best practices to the degree that in many cases they can come in and help improve a pharmacy's operation. So how does the board in prioritize enforcement cases? Well, we do this in, we have an established case priority system, one, two, three, four. Priorities one and two are the high risk, most important, do it now types of cases. Priorities three and four are of lesser importance, but they're not, not unmeaningful. Um, if you are a consumer with a medication error, you may not have taken it, you may have not been harmed, but that complaint is gonna be very important to you. And you would want the regulator to take action to review it just as the one where a serious violation has occurred. So um, we use the ranking system and we also have our inspectors in teams. And the team structure itself kind of lends itself to a prioritization in that those inspectors on the drug diversion and fraud team are looking at serious issues involving the movement of drugs from pharmacies to the streets illegally. Where as I learned earlier this week, a bottle of Prometh with coating $12 in a pharmacy, $1,200 on the street. So that there is a lot of momentum to get those drugs in the pharmacy outside the, pharma outside the pharmacy where they can make some money. Um, priority three and four complaints, because they're for the compliance teams, are the med errors, are the dirty pharmacies, are the types of violations that you want corrected, but they're not as eminent as a pharmacy operating, for example, without a pharmacist or someone working under the influence. 
what are the board case and complaint priorities and how inspectors, I just addressed that one. So how does the board maintain consistencies and investigations and enforcement outcomes? Well, first of all, we start off by ensuring that all cases before they're investigated are first of all reviewed by the supervising inspector who's going to assign it to one of his or her teams. That makes consistent the way that all the investigations are handled, whether or not one person assigns it or another person assigns it. And that's part of the goal of making your outcomes and your priorities consistent. Um, we're also, and then when the investigation reports come in, they're reviewed by the supervising inspector. We have a second set of eyes going on them, either a supervising inspector or perhaps um, Ms. Sotogren or myself, or we're in the process of hiring two chiefs of enforcement to perform that function. And we've needed to do this because of the growth in the board's enforcement program over the last couple of years. The board has also in, uh, instilled um, ask the inspector. So we actually have an inspector that's on call that will, uh, licensees can actually phone call or they can email and we do respond to those. So that was something new that the board has started this last year, which has gotten, which has been very well received. Does the board plan to adopt any more precedential decisions? That was a question that was asked. The board has one precedential case at this time. Should other decisions be adopted where the board believes that other, that broad public policy is involved that supports the board's mandate, the board will consider adopting the decision as an additional precedential decision. The current one involves a drug diversion. It was a pharmacy that was involved in drug diversion. Um, implementation of recently enacted legislation. What are the delays in promulgating regulations for Senate Bill 493 and what's the status of the state protocols and rules? And this is one, uh, I guess, was an education to me, not having been in doing these before, how long this takes um, to try to get these regulations through. However, we have, and, and thanks to Senator Hernandez for the support in this, we, um, California is paving the road in the United States and we're the first state to promulgate regulations that provide pharmacists with expanded care options, um, particularly in relation to the advanced pharmacist practice role. As a result, the board established a Senate Bill 493 committee that has met seven times since June 2014. The board has increased, and actually when I looked at the numbers, we've doubled our number of full board meeting dates in 2015 as compared to 2013. Currently, there are several components of Senate Bill 493. Nicotine replacement therapy, the regulation has already taken effect, January 25th, 2016. The hormonal contraception, um, the regulation is undergoing a 15-day additional comment period to add documents to the rulemaking file, and this was necessary based on the office, the advice of the Office of Administrative Law. The advanced practice pharmacists, there's two regulations, both have been adopted by the board. One rulemaking, uh, both rulemakings are going to be compiled and will be ready to go by um, April 1st, in terms, by April 1st, and we will send that to the department. Uh, immunizations was adopted by the board and it's currently undergoing review by the DCA, by the department. And travel medications, the comment period is closed and the comments received will be considered by the board. Um, You've got, as the board was developing the, 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 these regulations, the board was also required to finalize the sterile compounding regulations, which we have done, and also promulgate emergency regulations to develop a state protocol for naloxone. And that emergency protocol first took effect April 10th, 2015 with the permanent regulation January 2016. Jenny, how does the board regu uh, prioritize rulemaking efforts? Well. Um, most of our board, most of our regulations are in fact major regs. We have one, um, at one, one, of our, one of our licensing programs requires every time we change an item on the form, we have to do a rulemaking for it. Um, pretty slow and cumbersome, that's not our biggest priority. Most of the um, other regulations are assessed and taken up in the order with their impact for pu providing public safety. So the greater the public safety, the more likely we are going to do that first. And the way to point to that is in the last three years as we have moved away from the lessons we've learned in Massachusetts with the sterile compounding, we have taken to overhaul our regulations. And we started it once, we went through numerous iterations working with the profession and we needed to start over because the rulemaking itself had gotten so complicated you couldn't tell what the language looked like because we added and deleted things so many times. So we started over 
That particular rulemaking took us, um, I think we're up, clocking coming close to about a year since we started that process, but that rulemaking has taken precedence over everything because we strongly believe that we want those regulations into effect, both for the pharmacies in California, particularly the hospitals that need this guidance, and also for those outside the state that are shipping in medication. So it's, and it's also a resource issue for um, the same reasons pretty much everything else is you can't do everything first, you have to prioritize. And so those with the greatest public safety risk are what we put first. And um, I've been asked to talk a little bit um, about does the board ever initiate rulemaking to take action when anticipated legislation may be taken? How do pending board rules intersect with pending statutory changes such as those related to drug take back or compounding pharmacies? Well, generally, legislation is enacted first, and you do regulations to flesh out the requirements in the legislation. So, and sometimes controversial topics that you wouldn't have time to amply address in the legislative arena gets kicked back to the regulator or to another board to address. So that's part of the way that we believe that that's done. With respect to drug take back, drug take back, as Dr. Gutierrez said, we just released for public comment. We're halfway through the, the board's 45-day um, comment period with the comments to go back to the board at the end of April for the meeting. Um, drug take back is something that we've been waiting for the DEA to act on for a number of years. In 2007, our board was involved with the Integrate wa Integrated Waste Management Board in developing drugs or dr pilot programs or sample programs for drug take back in advance of waiting for the DEA to do something. Because of controlled substances and the way the Federal Controlled Substances Act is written, that if you are not the person to whom the prescribed controlled substance and, you're, and you possess it, you're violating federal law. And so the DEA was put in charge of basically revising that in a manner where people could give their drugs to someone else to get rid of them, to dispose of them so that they're not flushed down the drains or thrown into, trap, into um, our landfills. So in that particular way, um, in 2014, in September, the DEA finally did its DEA um, requirements for drug take back. The, the regulations are relatively complex. They run through 50 pages in the Federal Register. We have developed um, the synthesis of those, specifically what pharmacies have to do if they wish to take back drugs that are compliant with the DEA's policies. There are basically two forms, collection receptacles and mail back um, envelopes or packages. And so what we've done in our proposed regs at the current time is to take what those federal standards are and put them into a proposed regulation. Few pharmacists would read the, the federal register to identify what their requirements are in terms of meeting the requirements of the DEA's um, requirements. And additionally, because pharmacies are DEA registrants, if they fail to follow the requirements of the DEA, they run um, in possible danger of the DEA deciding to revoke their DEA permit, which would basically put most pharmacies out of business because they could no longer handle controlled substances. It's a very serious thing. We want them compliant. We want them able to, to do this where they want to do it, and we want them to do it safely. In the case of sterile compounding, the board began licensing sterile, com sterile injectable compounders in 2003 in California after we had three deaths in Walnut Creek. And when NECC happened, we immediately did what other regulators were. We, we were one of the few states at that point that had a licensing program. But we talked to the FDA, we jointly inspected some of the pharmacies that were out there that we knew were doing sterile compounding and that the DEA, or excuse me, FDA thought were potentially high risk. And then we also again immediately started working to how can we make certain our requirements are appropriate Earlier in 2013, excuse me, I'm talking too much, too much, too fast and too much. Um, in June of 2013, we also had another problem in California where this time sterile injectable medication was shipped into California from outside where it did reach patients. And we had some patients in Los Angeles that were blinded by the bad medication that was injected in their eyes. So we had already decided that there was a problem brewing, but we never saw any CC coming, which just changed as a regulator. If you were regulating pharmacies, particularly those that were doing sterile compounding prior to September of 2013 and didn't 
do something after 2013. You probably were abrogating your role as a regulator. You needed to recognize that this was a major event and regulators had to step back and take action. So we did, and we're still working on it. And, and I don't want to interrupt you, but I know I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes, and I think Senator Wykowski will as well, and uh, as soon as Chair uh, Salas comes back. But I did want to ask a couple of questions before you continue, and I know there are a couple of things that you may want to add to the uh, to address some other issues that we didn't uh, ask about. But one is on the drug take back. I know the, the program that you've developed and the regulation specifics about a pharmacy that a pharmacy may collect medical waste and, and take it back to the pharmacy. What if the legislature were to develop a, a mandatory take back program, which has been discussed here for the last few years? Uh, would you be able to do that? And can the board determine that a, a pharmacy then would be permitted under those circumstances if we do mandate it? Yeah, I think the regulations that we're working on is if a pharmacy were to do it, this is how you would go about doing it. What type of liners would you use? What is your, what what, what type of uh, DA registration changes need to make? So it's more like the how-to sure. on that side. But would that fit right into a mandate if it was, if we were to? I don't believe if you if you mandated something as as a regulator, we have regulations to do that. You have the legislature's authority. I don't see that we could override you even if we wanted to. But, but would it fit? I mean, you could use. The, yeah, I, I would. It, within what, what you're you, doing as a may could be a. The Amazing. only thing I'd, I'd caution in that, because we have had quite a lot of testimony from pharmacies, is you do have pharmacies that are located inside grocery stores and such. And there is some public issues with having uh, take back bins right next to the fruit and the vegetables. And there may be other issues that you may want to look at when you start. Uh, there are, so are some pharmacies that are very small. And they may not have enough space. So that's the only thing. And I can see that. And Senator Wykowski had a question, but I just wanted to follow up on that particular aspect because in most of the larger pharmacies, you're walking through a lot of food and everything else mm -hmm. before you get to the pharmacy department in the rear. Senator Wykowski. I guess the question is, is the local jurisdictions. I understand that San Luis Obispo and maybe Tulare have passed ordinances mandating pharmacists. I think Sacramento did it, uh, mandated. So how would that fit into the regulatory scheme? if the locals have said, it seems like the public wants this. Well, my understanding of those mandatory, at least from the testimony we received at the board, is that it could be done either through physical take back or through envelopes. So they could provide envelopes. And I know in um, San Luis, you know, was it San Luis Obisco or Santa, one of the counties. Santa Cruz. Was actually utilizing, some of the pharmacies were using take back envelopes. And that was sufficient. So that could be either or. It, my staff has indicated that it's not doesn't appear clear on your draft regulations that that's allowed that 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 uh, it's clear that local jurisdictions if they mandated it would come in um, and since I was the author of one of the pharmaceutical waste bills long long ago in 2011 we're still waiting for those regulations because that's included in the in right in and the bid. But, but again, our regulations tell how the pharmacy is to take back the drugs so that we've got a consistent system so that pharmacies and the patients around them are safe. And as Dr. Gutierrez said, the one thing that, we're, that concerns us is recycling centers. When you go into a recycling center and they're closed, what do people do with the stuff that they, that they want to recycle? They leave it there. That may be fine for certain kinds of products, but with drugs, you don't want someone walking into a pharmacy that's closed with a bag full of drug drugs they want to recycle or, re, or take back, we call them recycling. Um, and if that bin is, they can't deposit it there, you don't want them to set that outside the bin. And so that's one of the greatest problems we've got in those kinds of centers, but that's not all of them. But no, we have guidance. If you're gonna do a collection bin, this is what it looks like. This is how you have to remove liners. This is how much time you've got to do this. This is how you track it. This is how you change your DA registration. Right. And th these are, unlike other take back programs, these do have a street value. It's not like an, an old battery or paint that no one's gonna use. There are recyclable street value with some of the drugs that are being returned. Okay, if I could just a couple more quick questions. And uh, the implementation of 493, uh, there were some questions raised about the uh, hormonal contraceptive regulations and providing access to uh, uh, it, that the legislation was intended and whether it is, is maybe creating an obstacle. I don't know if it, if it is, but 
should clarifications be made to the, to the regulation to reflect the existing protocols specifically related to a patient being able to provide health information like blood pressure uh, or items known from technology, like they get something from their Apple Watch or their smart watch so that we can kind of advance that to make the access a little easier and provide greater information? We, we believe that the role of the pharmacist with the hormonal contraceptives is to just add increased access. Currently, um, when we had providers testify, they even, uh, obstetricians and gynecologists, that they do take blood pressure when they are administering or, or prescribing estrogens. It's not for every contraception, but it's certain drugs that you do want to make sure that you do check the blood pressure. And that is actually in the guidelines that we, um, from our experts, that were provided. I think the guidelines that Dr. Basink had actually provided us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Senator Hill. So just a couple more questions. I know the senators have to um, head off to floor session, just like I headed off earlier, if anybody was curious, mm -hmm. me and Assemblymember Bro and the others. But um, I just want to ask a couple questions, and I don't believe they've been asked already, but one is, um, I know in last year's budget, we had, with the Department of Justice, had funded uh, the Cures program, and just wondering how that's working with your industry and kind of where we're at. Why is it, I, I made a, quite a statement in the, uh, in our budget hearing last week. I was, yeah, well, never mind. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's not necessary to go into it. We strongly support the use of cures. We think that the cure system needs to be upgraded as quickly as possible. It needs to be provided with the resources so that it's quickly usable, it's accessible, it's reliable, and people actually want to use it. Because it's one thing we can do to help stop some of this proliferation, the overprescribing of opioids. So once it becomes easy, it doesn't disrupt the operations of either the prescriber or the, or the dispenser you'll get more used to it and you'll drive there. And the new system has some wonderful accoutrements. So we strongly support it. We're right around 60% of our um, pharmacists are registered in the system. I think some of the last 40% are gonna pose some challenges for us. We, we know that they're gonna be a little harder. The ones that are more attuned to it have probably already registered. Mm -hmm. Those that have not are gonna be a little bit harder. We're sending postcards through the mail to our um, licensees because we want them to be ready. We want them fully compliant by July 1. And, and just from a practicing pharmacist mm -hmm. perspective, what you can identify with the use of cures is your doctor shoppers. I mean, because sometimes if someone really wants to get these drugs, they'll go to an urgent care, they'll go to their family doctor, and nobody really knows because there's so many doctors and so many phys uh, pharmacies involved. This gives you a true source of truth of what's going on with that patient. I think of, I find it invaluable. Thank you. And what about, since we're talking about technology, but what about the Breeze program and how that's still operating and working? We're not part of Breeze. We started oh. and then we stepped back out of Breeze. Okay. Why did you guys step out of Breeze? We have an ownership structure that would have been difficult to track in the new in the Breeze parameters. We are one of the few boards that um, ownership of a pharmacy as it tracks through the system is a big deal to us. And it would have made it very cumbersome to be able to track ownership because of the way this, the, the record was set up, among other things, but, but that was principally it. Um, I don't know whether Ms. Sodegren wants to say anything more, but she actually was our point person um, that literally was going through the, the program design with Breeze folks, so. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just one more question. Do other state pharmacy boards do their own inspections for out-of-state compounding facilities? No, no we, are, we are unique in that. We are unique in that. Okay. We, we, we take our, protection role very seriously. And we do the issue with the Massachusetts, that was an out-of-state pharmacy. They were shipping drug into California. We were very close to have been impacted had we not been doing this. Most states don't have the resources we have either, and nor mm -hmm. do they have the expertise we've got. We've got over 10% of the nation's pharmacies in this state, and we have larger, a, a larger workforce of inspectors than other states have in part because we're inspecting sterile, we've got four staff to do in sterile compounders. But um, it, it, is a, it is a lot of work to send inspectors out of state, but we believe that the public needs to rely on and trust the medication that they're being administered, in this case, particularly in hospitals where a lot of these products go. Okay, thank you. Anything else you'd like to share? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, let's go ahead and bring up the uh, 
Panel B, professional groups, organizations, and individuals. Just come forward. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Brian Thank Warren you. with the California Pharmacists Association. Nothing like a full day hearing to welcome in the daylight savings time, so. Uh, Absolutely. Full day. Um, we saved you for the afternoon. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, we are uh, pleased to support the staff's recommendation to continue the board's sunset extension. Um, and with regard to the remaining issues that were highlighted in the committee report, we very much look forward to working with the board and the legislature and this, these committees towards addressing all of those issues uh, in a very productive manner. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you. Uh, my name's Marianne Bobro. I'm interim CEO for California Society of Health System Pharmacists. We too support the board's efforts, and uh, our focus, as always, is on patient safety. And as long as there are safeguards in everything that is being proposed moving forward, then we would support those as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Gregory Kramer with Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California. Uh, echoing some of these comments as well, we also support um, the re recommendations highlighted uh, specifically under issue number four, dealing with backlogs for licensure. And we'd like to thank committee staff and the Board of Pharmacy for working with us because we have over 115 clinics in the state of California mm -hmm. and significant backlogs have been uh, have been plaguing some of our operations in recent years, and we're relieved to hear that that has now um, become a thing of the past, but we support the staff recommendation as well to have a piece of legislation to codify uh, a 30-day processing time along with other streamlining measures. Got it. Thank you, I'm just looking at issue four, just to make sure we're on the backlogs. Okay, thank you, um, let me ask if there's Questions on the dais? Sure. Assemblymember Bro. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, ask all of you if you had any uh, opinion on the increased fees that the board proposed. I, I think uh, we would defer to, I mean, the, um, the board's fiscal analysis, looking at its fund condition. Um, we don't have an active position on the increased fee proposal yet. Uh, but it's something that we're looking closely at. We do want to ensure that the board is adequately staffed to be able to uh, sufficiently uh, you know, meet all of its statutory obligations. Uh, so that's still something that we're evaluating. Thank you. And I would agree with, with what Brian has just said in uh, knowing what happens in economic conditions and with the hiring of addition in, inspectors, um, I believe very strongly that there's probably a great need for that. And uh, PPAC hasn't officially made a position on that, but we'll put mm -hmm. it under further review and follow up. Okay. So thank you. Doesn't sound like there's outrage. <laughs> so um, <laughs> thank you for that testimony. Uh, anything else you'd like to share before we move on? No. Thank you guys for being here. I know it's been a long day. We're going to try to move ahead. Let's go ahead and... Uh, Move on to item number four, review of the Board of Psychology. So we're gonna have panel A join us. It's um, Stephen Phillips, Board President, Nicole Jones, Board Vice President, Antoinette Sorek, Executive Officer. Finish all three boards in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. <laughs> 